What's up, everybody? You might ask, why am I so dusty? I'm the dustiest dude you've ever seen. Because we do doing body work today. It's been a while. You guys haven't uh, gotten a paint video for a bit. Um, haven't really been doing much paint work. We've been uh, getting caught up on some mechanic stuff, so that's why you guys have been seeing a lot of that. But we got this little project here. This is actually for Charlie. Um, so Sarah was in charge of D-trim and getting this cab pulled and everything. So she got it onto this little roll around dolly and everything that we borrowed from our buddy Dave. And so I got a nice blank canvas here to work on. And you can see I already went around and circled all the dents and everything. And we're already getting started on some of the prep work. And we decided to uh, make a little bit of a little video for you guys on this. So we're thinking maybe something along the lines of uh, kind of showing you how to fix some dents. I don't know, just we're just gonna jam pack it full of knowledge. You're gonna get so much value out of this video that, you know, just make sure you watch it all the way through. So uh, without further ado, let me not waste any more of your guys' precious, valuable time. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to fix a dent, right? And so this is going to be done in a manner that you would probably just do on like something at your house, something you're kind of trying to do on a little bit of a budget. This isn't the like 110% way to fix a dent, but it is a good way to fix a dent. So I figured this was a perfect one to show you guys. This is the big boy. It's a good size. I wanted to put this here so you guys can see how deep it is. We're sitting at maybe eighth inch, quarter inch, something like that, deep. And more or less, the dent area is about what I have circled here. Maybe a tiny bit smaller on the sides. But step number one is to identify your dent and come up with a game plan on how you're going to fix it. So something shallow like this, or like it's not all like crinkled in like on a quarter panel or something, we can just use good old DA. And remember, tools are an investment in yourself. So if you want to do stuff like this and you want to save some money, you got to buy the tools. So this is just a regular six inch hook and loop dual action sander. You could even use an electric one that you could get at like Home Depot or something, like a five inch. Those aren't quite as good for what we're doing, but they'll work. The first step we're going to do, we're going to grind this down to bare metal. And I like using the DA versus something like an angle grinder because we're trying to keep the thickness of the sheet metal consistent and nice. And we're trying to not grind away a bunch of sheet metal and make it all thinned out in some spots. It smells like Brandon's melting that car over there. Yeah, so the next step that you guys are gonna do when you're fixing a dent is you gotta go on Dent Fix Equipment website and you gotta order a $3,000 dent pull system. No, I'm kidding, but um, something a little bit more entry level that you guys like DIY might want to like look into if this is, even if it's just one project you're doing, like I said, if you're trying to save that money, you gotta buy the tools. Would be like a Harbor Freight, like stud gun or something. Uh, we can insert like a picture they just weld a little stud on. You can plug it into like a regular 110 volt outlet. Like this is 220, right? So you might not have that or you might not be willing to sacrifice your, uh, your, di uh, your washer dryer outlet, you know, for hooking up a welder. Just be careful with those stud guns that you don't over pull the studs because if you start ripping holes in your sheet metal and you don't have a MIG welder, then it can get a little bit out of hand real quick and it can actually really compromise the quality of your repair. But what we're using today is like a professional type uh, dent pull system, which has a little ground magnet, and then we've got a little electrode with a puller on it. We'll show you guys how that works. All right, hopefully this works. So in general, everyone's got their own methods. I like to start on the deepest section of a dent like this first, because a lot of times what can happen 
is you start pulling that center section and some of the shallower, like minor damage on the outside of the dent will resolve itself without you having to like go all the way around it multiple times just to get it straightened out, right? So you saw right there, that was already starting to flex up and like kind of pull the whole dent without me having to work around the outside. See that? See right there how that locked it up? Yeah, buddy. And we're gonna do a little bit on the sides here to keep that tension on the metal, which we're not over pulling, but So at this point, what I like to do, I get out the worst of it, right? Then we're gonna take a little sanding block with some 80 grit on it. We're just gonna do a couple passes over this and that's gonna highlight our highs and our lows so that we know where we need to keep pulling. See that? You see it? You got a good shot? Oh yeah, look at that, beautiful. So you can see all these areas where the paper was hitting are either level or high. And then all these areas through here, still a little bit low. At this point, if I run this thing over it, yeah, see that? Get down in there, show them. We're, we're already up to maybe a 16th, right? So we've, we've pulled this dent to the point where theoretically we could put body filler on this right now and it wouldn't have an issue. It's gonna be real thin gonna be well within the manufacturer's specification of using the product, but we're gonna go that extra mile because it's Sarah and Charlie. And all that we're doing here is making very minor adjustments to the sheet metal And if you guys are using a stud gun at home, it works on a very, very similar concept to this, honestly. It's not much different. And one thing that I'll say with the studs is that when you're pulling, if you notice starting it, that it's that little area is starting to turn into, a, I call it a volcano, right? So you're starting to notice the sheet metal starting to really like flare up around that stud. Stop pulling you're gonna rip a hole in it, okay? So if it's starting to do that, that means you got a lot of tension in other areas of the sheet metal around where you're pulling, and that specific little area isn't loose enough for you to get that metal to come up and be level. So you can keep yanking on it, but you're probably just gonna rip a hole in the sheet metal. So stop while you're ahead, break that stud off, and relieve some of the tension on the rest of the dent around that area before you go back and try to pull something in that spot again. Actually, while we're on the topic, there's a really cool book. And I know, right, it's 2023. Who the fuck reads books anymore, am I right? But uh, there's a really cool book and there's a lot of pictures, right? There's a lot of pictures and it's like, I think the book is like less than 100 pages too. So it's very simple. It's called The Key to Metal Bumping, okay? And if this is something that interests you, if this is a trade that interests you, and it's something you want to get good at, and you wanna practice, or even if you're thinking about just doing your one car and you're a little bit scared of doing the metal work, get that book. It's super cheap. I think on Amazon it's like, I don't know, $10 or something and it's worth skimming through that. And you don't even have to read all the sections because there's stuff in there. Like I think the book was written in the 50s or 60s and there's stuff in there about doing lead work and things like that, which is another awesome skill. We also have a video, right, on that. If you guys want to check that out, we'll put a link. Um, there's stuff in there you don't even have to read if you're just learning about doing metal work. So in reality, what, you got to maybe read like 20 or 30 or 40 pages of a tiny little book that's got a bunch of pictures in it. That's like reading like five pages of a normal book.
Look at that. So you can already see just on that last uh, pass that I did with the 80 grit before I did some more pulling, we've just got some very minor, shallow little low spots in between some of the spots that I'm pulling. We're gonna call this one good. So what I'm gonna do to finish it off is I'm gonna take the little die grinder, run the die grinder across the top. That's gonna knock down some of our little high peaks from the spots that we pulled. And then I'm gonna take the 80 grit DA to finish it all off nice and smooth. So we got a really nice uh, surface for the body filler to stick to. And now I wanna be real with you guys. I've been doing this for 14 years, okay? The first time you go to fix a dent, you know, this is YouTube, there's movie magic, right? But I did finish this in like 10 minutes, okay? The first time you go to do a dent, you might spend three hours on just doing what I did right there. And that's okay because you're just learning. So be patient, but also understand that there's a reality outside the video, right? I said, movie magic. So be patient, keep trucking, focus on one little thing at a time, break the whole big project down into little pieces, and that makes it a lot more manageable. But voila, dude. Look at that. <laughs> we got, look at that. That's nothing, dude. We got a little teeny wee baby bit of body filler going in that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Damn near metal finish that one. I got three things that I wanted to uh, clarify for you guys before we moved on to the uh, body work step or the like filler work step. Number one being, I'm sure you guys are probably wondering, do I have to grind down to the metal on every single dent? And the answer is generally no. If you look up here on the roof, we've got some spots kind of like this that are little tiny dings that aren't deep at all but they aren't thin enough that I can sand them out without uh, using some body filler. Sometimes there are ones that are very, very shallow and you can use a nice flat hard block and go across it and you can actually sand it out um, without adding any material. You can just use what's already there and you can sand it flat. But there are little dings such as this one that are within you know, the thickness that we don't um, need to pull it, right? It's not too deep. We don't need to uh, grind it down to the metal. Obviously, if you're gonna pull it, you gotta grind it down to the metal. But in general, if your paint is not cracking, flaking, or um, you know peeling up anywhere, right? And the original finish is still in good shape, then it's more than fine for you to put body filler over top of it, so long as it's sanded with a nice coarse grit, like 80 or 150. Also, it kind of depends on the product. Read your data sheet for your body filler, make sure that it lists uh, existing paintwork or OEM paintwork as one of the substrates that are suitable for putting your body filler over. So the second one is, I I'm trying to think of like a good analogy for you guys that might kind of help you visualize it a little bit. But if you can imagine, you've got a panel and the amount of sheet metal that's contained within that panel is a fixed amount. When it gets, dented, smashed, whatever. Uh, essentially what it's doing is adding more material to the panel than that's already there. And it's doing that because it's stretching that sheet metal. So a lot of times you'll wind up with a dent, kind of like this one. And it's hard to see on the camera because we don't uh, have it highlighted for you guys, but we got a dent here 
And then you see kind of around the edge, there's a little bit of a ring and we call that like a high crown, right? So there's a dent and then around the edge of it, you'll have an area that's kind of raised up. This actually like seems like a high spot. A lot of times when you're pulling the dent, you'll resolve that uh, without having to do anything about it. So essentially, you know, you've got your low and you've got your, oh, I don't have three hands here. You know, you've got your low, you've got your high next to it. And when you pull the low, a lot of times you wind up right nice and flat. That doesn't always happen. There are a couple ways that you can tackle that. First of which is something like this, a little like hook body hammer. You can do your pulling and then you can gently go around the edge of your dent and just tap down that crown, right? We're not hitting hard, but we're doing a lot of hits, right? A lot of small, little, tiny taps because we're making small adjustments. We're not trying to just go whap and tap it down and then wind up just caving in the whole thing. You gotta be gentle with the sheet metal, especially if it's on these newer cars, it's real thin. The older cars, sometimes you gotta apply a little bit more force. The other reason I like the studs and using like the pulling system that we do is when you weld that stud, it actually puts a good amount of heat into that little area. And what heat does is it contracts sheet metal. After you do the stud weld, it helps contract the steel a little bit. And then when you're doing the pull, it will stretch a little bit, but in general, you're still winding up with like a net negative, right? Like you're still pulling in that sheet metal a little bit more than it was when it was damaged, if that makes sense. That's a good reason why we use the studs. Um, hammer dolly is also good. That's a little bit more like a cold method, right? And that's something I could do an entire separate video on. And also if you read that book, you'll learn how to do that in there as well. And I don't have to make a whole long video explaining it to you. I just wanted to highlight uh, talking about that little high crown because I know you guys are probably going to be dealing with that on at least one dent if you got a lot of dents on your car. Lastly, before we get to the body filler step, I wanted to talk about feather edging. So we've got this area of bare metal here where we did our dent pull. And then here we've got a transition going into the existing paintwork, which is in good shape and it's not failing. So what I did is I took my 80 grit and we've stepped out all the way to here with the 80. So we're well past the area of damage. And then the transition between the paint and the metal is feathered out pretty decent. We could go a little bit further but what I like to do, some guys like to keep their body filler within the bare metal and they feather out into the paint beyond that. What I like to do is keep my feather edge closer to the damage and then feather into the paintwork and I actually put body filler over this edge. And that creates a nice transition between the old paintwork, the body filler, the sheet metal, and then on this side back into the old paintwork. And that helps because we've got to be, always be thinking about a repair in terms of how it's going to look five, 10 years down the road. If you apply primer over top of this edge and then you have body filler and you have a gap here where the primer is compensating for the difference in mills, you can wind up with the primer shrinking back over time and this edge exposing itself. It's more likely to expose itself. Whereas if you put body filler over that edge and then you feather it all the way out, I can show you guys an example of what I'm talking about on the nose here, where I've got this damage feathered into the paintwork and the transition has a very, very, very thin layer of body filler over it. Body filler really doesn't shrink much over time. I think it's something like 2%. It's a very, very small amount. So you're a lot less likely down the road to see that edge if you do it this way versus the other way. So step one, I blew it off with some air, which gets all the big dust particles and everything ripped off the surface. Step two before body filler is I'm taking just a regular solvent borne wax and grease remover. I use this virtual waterborne because it evaporates quicker. And I'm getting to a clean spot on my microfiber and I'm just spraying it down a little bit. And then I'm going over top of my surface and I'm wiping it in a nice circular motion to just get any of that embedded dirt and dust ripped off the surface. 
I don't like to take this and spray it directly on the panel at this stage because I don't want it to uh, bite in underneath any of the solvents to kind of um, be pooled up in there and get real wet. Um, I like to keep it a little bit drier at this step, especially since we're gonna be putting body filler over it within like the next half hour. All right, so what the hell am I doing here? We're not playing Tetris with the roof. We're getting set up to do our body filler work. So what I like to do is just take some of this skinny tape and when I got a panel like this where it's just beat to shit and there is dents everywhere and it's also white so it's really hard to see where I have sanded. Um, I went around with the DA and the dent is in the center of each one of these shapes. And I went around and I feathered out a nice big area relative to how big the dent is. So if it's a small dent, I didn't go out too far. This is like a smaller one. If it's a big dent, then I feathered out a nice big area like this because we're gonna be doing, and by big, I don't mean deep. I mean like the surface area, right? Like this one here had a bunch of small dents, but they were just like boom, 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 boom. So I mapped out the area and essentially the rule is the tape is lava. So we're gonna stay away from the tape. We're not going to put our body filler on the tape. This just gives me a visual guide so I don't miss any dents in the whole roof, right? Because there's a shitload of them. If this was something that like was a little bit more of an in-depth project, it was something that had to be a higher quality. Um, like this is a work truck that for Charlie, but he wants they want it just a little bit nicer than like a normal work truck. But if this was like a full complete respray type deal and it was like a um, something that might go to like a show or it might be something that's supposed to be like a really, really, really nice driver, I probably would have just skimmed the whole roof on this thing, honestly, and just put like a thin coat on it. But let me show you guys my method for mixing body fillers a little bit different than most people's. So let me give you guys a rundown on how we mix our body filler. So for me, mixing body filler is all in the preparation. So if you do all the prep steps uh, properly and you get everything ready ahead of time, then it eliminates a lot of the stress of like having to mix it real quick and like worry about the ratio of the hardener and worrying about if your spreader's not clean or whatever. So I always get my spreader's nice and cleaned up and ready to go. I have my mixing board cleaned off and ready to go. Uh, I know it looks dirty, but I sand this smooth every time I use it. And uh, so this is all nice and smooth and ready to go. I got a little stir stick for scooping out my body filler. And then this is the one thing that's gonna be a bit different than some of the other videos you're gonna see. So I use my paint scale for mixing the body filler. Um, obviously, you don't have a paint scale at home. So what you can do is pick up like a cheap food scale. Um, anything that weighs like small amounts precisely because that's what you're gonna need to do. So if you got a food scale that weighs in grams, you can use that. And I think they're like 15 or 20 bucks. Again, invest in the tools, it's worth it. You might say like, oh, I don't need to weigh out the hardener in my body filler. It's like, well, you don't have to, no. But if you want a consistent result and you don't wanna to have to worry about your hardener cooking off the body filler too quick or having issues with it cracking later down the road or things like that, then it's best to always weigh out your body filler. We got our tray. You're gonna set that on the scale and then we're gonna zero it out. Now, what I would like to do, cause we're in Tucson, it's hot out here. I've got two different types of body fillers. They're both made by Evercoat. One of them is Rage Ultra Extra and the other one is just the regular Extra. So uh, what I normally do is I mix these 50-50. And I do that because the Rage Ultra Extra has a really long cure time. So uh, I think just this stuff on its own is something like 30 minutes or 40 minutes that you get to work with it before it hardens off. That might be a bit too long for if you're in like a cooler climate and stuff like that, but essentially what you can do is ratio a little bit of this in with the normal stuff, which this stuff normally kicks off in a couple minutes, and that can uh, change your like cure time that you get. So I've got a lot of areas to do, so I'm gonna mix this 50-50, and that's gonna get me about 10 minutes worth of work time. So we'll start with this guy. And as for the amounts, um, I wish I could tell you guys uh, that there's some kind of science to 
how much you should mix, but it's really just like, you're just gonna have to learn. You, you start to kind of cue into like how much body filler it takes to do a certain area um, over time, right? It's not something you really, you just gotta guess for a while. <laughs> But we're taking the guesswork out of all of this setup and stuff so that at least uh, the curing and stuff like that's all consistent. So we're doing 100 grams of our regular filler. And then we're gonna do 100 grams of our long dry time filler. So for a total of 200 grams, a body filler and that should do all the spots that I have with more than enough and if not then mixing a little bit more is not the end of the world all right so we're at 203 there we can go ahead and get the extra off the stick and then we're gonna make sure we put the lids back on don't leave the lid off your body filler it will dry out the resin in it and then it will not be as easy to scoop your body filler out later and it won't lay out properly. So make sure you put the lids back on there at least a little bit so that it's not drying out. The other thing I like to do anytime I'm mixing is I'll add a little bit of this plastic honey. They'll sell this at any paint store that you're getting your stuff. And essentially all this is, is the resin that's already in that body filler. And we're adding a little bit more resin because it helps it to lay out a little bit smoother and it leaves it with like a nice creamy texture. And we're not trying to get like a whole lot of fill. You saw we only got some spots with like a 16th or a 32nd of an inch of, you know, depth to the dents. So we don't need a lot of body to the filler. We just want it to lay out nice and smooth and pinhole free so that we don't have to do multiple applications of filler which eats up a lot of time. So here's the magic. I'm gonna take my stir stick off the scale so that <laughs> we wind up with an accurate number. We're at 208.9. So you're gonna pull out your, your uh, pocket calculator. 209, oops, 208.9. And you're going to multiply that number by 0.02. That's the amount of hardener that you put in that much body filler. That is the precise amount. That's what gets you the most accurate cure time on the body filler. That's what gets you with a consistent hardness of the filler. So if you have to do multiple applications, the filler is always going to sand the same. You'll notice that if you don't do this, when you apply different coats of filler, they all sand differently and you wind up with the whole thing kind of wanting to do this. It makes it really hard to flatten everything out if you're not using a really, really heavy grit for the entire process. So again, consistency. We're trying to eliminate variables so that the stuff that is difficult is easier. So we're gonna go ahead, get our hardener. I already needed this, make sure you always need it. So when you got the cap on, just take your thumb and work it around and squeeze it and really get all the stuff in there mixed together real good because we don't want all that liquid crap to like shoot out all over the place. And yeah, you wanna make sure this is mixed up real nice as well. So we were at four point what? 4.1. So we gotta put 4.1 grams of hardener in this. So that's 2.5. Three point one, four point oh, and we're gonna do a little tiny off on the side. Four point two, that's fine. We're within a tenth of a gram, so we're not gonna sweat that. So we got our spreaders, we've got our body filler all ready to go. Let's spread some mud. Here's a really bad habit that I've gotten into. Um, that I'm gonna tell you not to do right now, but you're gonna see me doing it anyway. Um, because I told you, Tucson, the weather's hot. Our body filler here cooks off super, super quick. So something I got into a bad habit of doing when I was younger, and I still do because I'm a piece of shit, is I mix the body filler with the stir stick first, 
and then I go back over it with the spreader when I'm stirring it. Um, and you don't want to stir it with a stick because it introduces a lot of air bubbles into it. It makes a pinhole more. I've just gotten into the habit because it makes stirring the body filler go really, really, really quick. Just don't do it, okay? <laughs> don't get into the habit and then you wind up like me, stuck in your ways and doing it all the time. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not the worst thing to do. Uh, it just makes it pinhole a lot more. And then I got to go back over and fill the pinholes before I prime it and whatever. You know, I'll deal with it then. Is it smarter to just do it right or the more righter way <laughs> and not have to do the pinholes? Yes, definitely. But like I said, I'm grumpy and old and stuck in my ways. Time is money. Yeah, time is money. And I am wasting time by doing it this way, but I don't care. So the thing I do to help alleviate some of the air bubbles that I have created when I stir it is when I'm mixing it with the spreader, I'm actively pressing down on it into the mixing board, right? And that helps to push out air, that helps to pop the bubbles, essentially, of air that are in there. And you can see on the surface, you see those bubbles popping, right? That helps to smush the body filler down and get all of those air bubbles out. And we are, you know, you see me kind of smushing it and mixing it and then we're going back over and kind of collecting it all back up into a little center point and that's to help keep it on the mixing board so that we don't wind up with it spilling out all over the place. I know I have the worst body filler mixing technique. Again, I learned a lot of bad habits with mixing body filler when I first started and it's been very hard to kick those habits, but at least I'm aware that they're bad habits, right? Some people don't know. <laughs> All right. So, going spot by spot. And we're being sure that we are avoiding the tape because remember I said the tape is lava and we don't want to touch the lava. And when you're applying your filler, it's all about trying to get it as smooth as possible. And it's all about trying to get the edges where the body filler meets the paint nice and tapered off. You don't want the edges to be all built up super high because the edges are the hardest part to feather out. So you see around the edge, it's got kind of a nice thin taper on the material going into the paint. That section is good. And you guys might ask, why do I have three different spreaders all cleaned off? And it's because of stuff like this, where I might want to get the body filler on there a little skinnier, right? With thinner. So I'm going back over it with that spreader to thin it out so I don't have a whole bunch of build on there. And then also, I have a little guy because we've got a mix of different sized damage areas. And I can't use the big spreader here, otherwise I'm gonna to be touching lava, so. Noticing a theme in today's video of me talking about volcanoes and lava, and essentially we're National Geographic now. So you guys are welcome. I'm getting educated on nature and body work at the same time. I do like these metal spreaders for a lot of stuff versus the plastic. They all have their pros and cons, but the metal ones really help you to get it on nice and flat so you don't wind up with too much build. Problem being, sometimes they get it on too flat and you don't wind up with enough build. So on the bigger areas with more damage, I always try to use the plastic fillers because you can put a little bit of a bend in them and the bend will help create kind of a little mountain of filler 
where you can stick your shirt into the stuff that you just did. And I probably goes without saying at this point, but make sure that anywhere you're putting body filler, it's sanded underneath. I put the tape on a point where I know that it's sanded. So in theory, I could go all the way up to that tape and it's still going on top of something that's sanded. You do not want to put body filler over something that's not sanded. It will not stick. Don't try to convince yourself that it's going to stick because all it's going to do is crack in a very short period of time and you're going to be redoing it and you're going to be very sad. As you guys can see, I already got some of the other spots sanded down, but I wanted to give you a little bit of like a quick rundown on the sanding that you're gonna do. So you saw how I got the body filler on there. I showed you guys how to mix it and stuff. And the next step is gonna be picking a block that's the right uh, flexibility and size and contour for the shape that you're doing. This area has a bit of a, you know, a little bit of a bend to it. Um, so I went ahead and picked a, a block that's got a spring steel insert in it on the backing here and that helps to give it a little bit of a, a flex but still keeps a nice curve to it right pretty much the rule of thumb is you want to choose the biggest block you can for an area and the flattest block that you can for an area right like the stiffest block so if i were blocking on this flat roof section i would probably use something that didn't even have as much bend as this because it doesn't really need to flex that much to match the contour of this big flat roof. But we're in an area where we got like a kind of tight bend going this way and a little bit of a bend going this way. So we need some flex. Also the repair, it's about this big. We're picking a block that's a bit bigger than that so that we're kind of bridging across the damage and it's giving us a nice flat cut. Uh, additionally, we've got 80 grit on here. And you might be thinking like, oh, Fred, you're crazy. Like, oh, that's way too abrasive. Like, why are you doing that? Um, body filler, you have to cut it with a heavy grit, all right? If you start trying to sand this repair down with 220 or, you know, 320 or something, uh, A, it's gonna take forever. And B, say this is the surface of your panel, this repair here, right? These little peaks are like the Bondo spreader marks. And then this is some of your lows. The 220 grit's gonna do a really good job of kind of doing something like this. It's gonna cut down the worst part of those peaks, but it's gonna leave a lot of this low and it's gonna, you're gonna wind up with it looking kind of like this. The really heavy, like sharp teeth on the 80 grit, it's gonna take this and it's gonna fucking cut it flat. This is your starting point. Flat is your starting point. You don't wanna start with this and then try to keep feathering out with like 600 and whatever. And like people get wild with the bodywork shit. Like I don't understand why, like just start with the 80. And if you want to show them over here, show them what I'm talking about. Look at this. You got this big old spot. We know that this is flat because I'm not seeing any gaps in the body filler. And my whole transition around the whole edge here is sanded and tapered into the surrounding paintwork with no hard edge. As a rule of thumb, what I normally try to do, and it doesn't happen perfectly on every single repair, but in my 80 grit, I try to stop once I start seeing any metal or anything just barely showing through because that gives me a few mils of material for me to feather out to my finer, final grit before primer so that I don't have to go back over everything, right? So like this one, I was cutting it real close. You can kind of see what I'm talking about. So this one's all 80 gritted and you can see I got some of my factory primer or my bare metal kind of starting to show through a little bit right there. Around the edge, I've got some of the factory e-coat right here. And even on this peak, I got a little bit of metal and a little bit of metal poking through right here. There's still enough material on here that I can guide coat this and feather it out to 220 before primer so that I don't have to go back over. I don't wind up with like a low spot. Yes, you want to feather out to 220 at least before your primer. 
Obviously, it depends on what type of primer you're using. Some thinner primers or like cheap primers like lacquer and stuff, you want to feather out to an even finer grit because it's going to shrink back like crazy. And if you don't have a big abrasive scratch underneath the primer, then there's nothing for it to swell back into. You don't want to sand an 80 grit and then primer over your 80 grit. You want to feather it out to a finer grit before you prime it so that you don't worry about any type of shrink back and then you just see all your body work scratches and all your nasty crap later down the road and then your paint looks terrible. So we're gonna stop there. You can see on our edges, I got a little bit of factory primer showing through here. This edge is nice and feathered where the paint transitions into the bare metal. Same deal over here. And we're just barely starting to see that kind of showing through a little bit. You can see the coloration, but you can't, it's not actually protruding through. So that means in my transition areas here that are real critical, where they might show back up later, when I feather out the 220 grit, it's still got plenty of material and it doesn't start like digging down. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Maybe not. <laughs> Last step, make sure you buy this. It's worth its weight in gold. This is dry guide coat. Don't use that shitty rattle can stuff. It's like 99 cents or whatever. You wanna use the dry guide coat powder. So all these areas here where we had the body work, we're gonna go over with a nice heavy coat. You want it to be a nice, even thick black. And you can see where the sanding marks stop on either side. And we wanna make sure that we got every single sanding mark filled with that guide coat. And then all we're gonna do at this point is get a little soft pad with some 220 grit. I don't know where it's at. Something like this kinda, like a little spongy sanding pad. We're gonna throw some 220 on here. It's already on there. And then we're literally gonna go over this until all of those 80 grit marks are completely gone. So we're gonna get it all feathered out entirely to 220 grit. That way the primer doesn't have any big nasty scratches to swell back into. But essentially after that, the rest of this is getting buzzed with a DA with 220. Um, all the edges we're gonna do with a little red scotch pad or a little piece of paper if we need to get like kind of down in a groove or something. And then it's all ready for primer. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. And uh, I don't know, do we have any other videos for the primer and beyond? Yeah, we got a uh, couple of ones, I think. Yeah. The epoxy primer. So check those out. Hope you enjoyed, and if you did, like, comment, and subscribe.